Hi, I'm Reverend Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in San Diego. Thank you so much for watching today. If you'd like to support the work that we do here, please consider making a contribution. Go to our website. It's easy to do. Thank you in advance for that contribution. Reverend Wendy presents a talk that explores and expresses the truths of unity and that there are real world practical things that we can do to deepen our experience of spirituality and help us in our daily lives. So we're concluding a series of talks this month on the topic of the spiritual path. And in the first message, I talked to you about what the path is and what the path is not. Then I talked to you about the idea of intuition and guidance on the path. And then last week, you were blessed with Ken Fendrick's message on appreciation on the path. And each of those, if you think about it, what the path is and what it isn't, intuition on the path, appreciation on the path, a lot of that has to do with the inward aspect of the path. And today, I want us to take it outside of ourselves. And so today, I want to talk about the idea of service and action on the path, service and action on the path. I remember a question I heard many years ago, and it was this. If you were arrested and accused of being a Christian, and you could fill in anything else in the blank there, a good Jew, a Buddhist, um, but if you were um, arrested and accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Isn't that good? Isn't that good? You know, the Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, really teaches and believes whatever path you're on, really go deep into that path. Really practice that path. Really practice that teaching. And when you do, there will be more than enough evidence to convict us of being that. And so we in this room resonate with and align with the idea of being spiritual and practicing our spirituality. So what does that really look like? I want to talk to you about what that looks like to me. And so as we begin, I want to, I want to share with you the idea that it's all about the challenge to think outwardly. That being awake spiritually and being engaged on the path, active on the path, requires that we really think outwardly, that we think beyond just ourselves. I heard a word the other day, I've been looking at a whole lot of financial planning stuff and estate planning stuff for my family and for the Unity Center. And as I was doing a bit of research on that topic and on the whole idea of charitable giving, and donor-advised funds and stuff like that, I heard somebody speaking about their view on giving and supporting the charities that they believe in. And the person used the word, he said, I don't believe in being that we should be selfish, but I also don't believe that we should be selfless. I believe and want to practice the idea of otherness. I like that. I had never heard that play on the word, otherness, say that with me, otherness. Otherness does not discount ourselves, but it recognizes that we are part of a larger community, part of a larger whole. And to the extent that we recognize that and to the extent that we give ourselves into that, we help to make the world a better place, not just only for us, but for everyone else. This idea of thinking outwardly, if you're familiar with our Bible and some of our Bible stories, and if you're familiar with the story of Jesus and the crucifixion, you may remember that Jesus was crucified between two thieves. And as they, the story goes, as they are on the cross, one of the thieves looks to Jesus and chides Jesus gives him a bad time and says, are you not the Christ? If you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. And the other thief looks at the one who has just chided Jesus, and the other thief says, in essence, he has done nothing wrong. He has done nothing wrong. We are the ones who have done something wrong. And Jesus then speaks to that thief and says, you will be with me in paradise. 
That second thief thought outwardly. That second thief thought beyond his own current difficult circumstances and was able to see beyond himself to, with, with compassionate eyes to another. He recognized who was in between, who was next to him. When we think outwardly, we begin to recognize our oneness with each other. And when we recognize our oneness with each other, so many of the barriers that seem to keep us apart begin to dissolve, and we connect in a very different way. Another key point that I want to share with you about this idea of action and service on the path is this, that in service to others, we forget our own misery or at least can put it in better perspective. Think about that for a moment. In service to others, in service to others, we forget our own misery or at least put it in some perspective. It is not at all uncommon in therapy for a therapist to suggest to someone who's feeling very depressed and very down to get outside of themselves and extend themselves in care and concern for another, for another, to think beyond oneself. This story is a short personal story, but it goes back a lot of years. When I was in ministerial school, one of the things that we were required to do was to go out into some of the hospitals or some of the nursing homes and spend time in service to those who were either hospitalized or in a nursing home. And I remember going during Thanksgiving to Truman Medical Center to their convalescing area. And I was feeling incredibly homesick. It was my first major holiday away from home. And, and here I was in ministerial school, and it was just days before Thanksgiving, and I was in service to those in the convalescent home. And that particular convalescent home had people who were really, really struggling with all sorts of physical challenges and mental and emotional challenges. And while I was there visiting and, and trying to be of service, a very, very old woman who was partially paralyzed, partially blind, looked at me as best she could. She was eating some cookies or something. She looked at me as best she could and she said, oh, sweetheart, are you hungry? And in that moment, I thought I was there to serve them. In that moment, I was so served by her. In that act, I was able to get outside of my own puny little sadness that felt so big to me at the time and, and feel her love and her connection. One of the ways that we continue to live a life that is more joy-filled and more purposeful or more meaningful is to find that delicate balance be between keeping our own difficulties and sadnesses, sadness and problems in perspective by willing to reach out to those that are probably in a worse condition than we are to help us keep centered and focused. I shared this with you, I think, a year or so ago. I came across a program on Netflix. I'm not a big television watcher, but I, I stumbled onto this program. I think Spirit led me there, called The Kindness Diaries. How many of you have heard of The Kindness Diaries? Raise your hand high so I can say, okay, you have a homework assignment. And it's a fun homework assignment. If you have Netflix, you can do this. Turn on the program called The Kindness Diaries. It's in its second season. This season, the theme is always the same, but it's about this young man. He's young because he's younger than I am. He's in his 40s. <laughs> and he is traveling the world, literally traveling the world, in a small little vehicle with a camera crew behind him, living out of the kindness, relying upon the kindness of strangers. And in the second season, he starts in Alaska, and he's going to be driving from Alaska all the way to Argentina. With no money, he will not accept money. He relies on the kindness of strangers wherever he stops to give him food and lodging for the night. And you see him asking people in the all different places 
and in all different circumstances, can I spend the night with you? <laughs> now just stop there for a moment. <laughs> How would that land on you? And it is an incredibly inspiring program to watch the connections that are made. He's not, obviously, he doesn't always get a yes, and you see the way people struggle with their no. But you also see the way people open up with their yes, and why and how they open up with their yes, and how often, not always, but how often it is the one or the ones who seem to have the very least who are the quickest to open up. And the beautiful twist of the Kindness Diaries is that every once in a while, he is so deeply touched by the way the person has extended kindness to him that because he comes from a background of means, he winds up giving lavishly to support whatever they're involved in. And sometimes it might be charity work, sometimes it, it might be that the person who opened their home that evening is someone who's struggling for the finances for a surgery or something, and he magically makes that happen. The Kindness Diaries, it'll be well worth your watch. And so my point is, in service to others, we forget our own misery, or at least put it in perspective. He began this journey because he, as a young person, had been bullied and had felt an awful lot of pain and an awful lot of abandonment. And he wanted to practice and see how kind humanity really is, because we don't always get that story from the news, do we? No, we don't. Third is that service on the spiritual path. Service on the spiritual path is to be given with no strings attached. And this is where it can get hard. This is where, for many of us, it can get hard. We, it's very human when we do something for another to want what? A thank you, some sort of acknowledgement, maybe some reciprocity. And there are times and places where that's okay. But that's not the same thing as true sacred service, which has no strings attached to it. In the Bhagavad Gita, it's called seva. It's sacred service that's done with no motive other than to be of help and service to another. It is done as a way to grow and to develop spiritually. And so when we notice that we have, when we are aware that we have done an act of service that has not been met with a thank you or a degree of appreciation, it is important for us to go deeper inside of ourselves and to ask, what is that really about? Was I really giving to be of service here or was there some other agenda at work? And not to find fault with ourselves, but at the same time to be honest with ourselves. Because our real growth comes when we're not trying to always make things even out, but we're willing to extend ourselves and go that second mile. Jesus talked about this same thing when he talked about to love those who do not love you, to love those who are difficult to love. We might say that we could say the same thing about service, to be in service to, to care about those that we're more inclined to hold back from. In Jesus' teaching when he said that we are to love those that are difficult to love, he then went further to say that we have no reward when we only love those who love us. The reward comes when we love beyond. Why? There's a very clear reason why. Because in order to love those that are difficult, we have to build a greater capacity inside of ourselves. And that's all about individual spiritual growth and awakening. One of the best things that I have found to practice when I'm really devoted to and working on living my life from great, a greater, more authentic degree of service, and I notice in myself that, boy, it's not even being noticed by others or doesn't seem to be appreciated, you know, that human part that, that's feeling upset. I try to remember this teaching that I shared with you earlier from the Bible. Do it all as if you were doing it for God. Say that with me. Do it all as if you are doing it for God. It's like 
put, it's like paying it forward in the biggest cosmic way possible, the biggest karmic way possible. Do it all as if you were doing it for God. When we do that, the journey becomes more joyful and easier. And we actually look for ways to be of service. We look for ways to make a difference. As I was working early this morning on the Just for Today message that I put out, something came to me that had never come to me before, and it was the idea of blessings. All of us in this room, I'm sure, have on occasion made it a practice to count our blessings, right? Count your blessings. And today, as I was at my computer and typing out the Just for Today message, what came out was, rather than count my blessings today, I really want to practice to be a blessing today. It's a tiny little difference, but I think it's a significant difference. I don't think it's an either or. I think they're both equally valuable, and they are different. To be a blessing today, to be a beneficial presence wherever we are. Remember, if you were accused and arrested for being a unity person, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Fourth point is that oftentimes we think we have to go somewhere else to do this work. And while there are certainly many places far away that we can do this work, we must never stop doing the work right where we are. We need to keep doing the work right where we are. That's what I think in part, the mystical teaching of where you take off your sandals, where you stand is holy ground. In other words, right where you are in your life, where you work, where you come to church, where you live is holy ground. That's your first place and my first place to take care of. Right here, your family, your neighborhood, your spiritual community our spiritual community, is where we are first and foremost to be willing to be of service, to think outwardly, to think beyond ourselves. And when we do, amazing things happen. When we are willing to be a blessing, when we are willing to extend kindness first, we will never know what doors of opportunity and blessing we may be opening for ourselves. To prove that, I want to read to you a story that I've kept for many years because it is one of the most powerful stories to demonstrate this point that I have ever come across. In 1979, in San Diego, a new deputy sheriff had been called on his day off to cover for an officer who was ill. Being new and knowing nothing, being new and knowing next to nothing about this particular beat, the man began driving around to familiarize himself with the area. While he was doing this, he received an emergency call. A child was choking. He had decided to take the new freeway because of the impossible traffic on Highway 101. Remember, this is 1979. (laughs) But when he got to the place where he needed to exit, there was no off-ramp. It had not yet been finished. And between him and the road, all that existed was a deep, wide ditch and a steep embankment. He got out of his car and looked in desperation at the busy road below, the road he couldn't reach. When he turned around, he saw a man sitting on a gigantic earth-moving machine and asked if he could help. The officer said, yeah, sure, if you can build me a road. I have an emergency, a child choking, and I don't have the time to get around. So the man did just that. He made a temporary road. It seemed like hours, but in reality, it was only a short time before the officer was able to get through. He raced to the scene, hoping he would not be too late. He grabbed the baby and automatically began carrying out emergency procedures. Within a few seconds, an object flew from the baby's throat to the floor, a very tiny button that had mercifully let in a little bit of air. Soon, a fireman rushed into the room with oxygen. The child screamed, turned red, and finally started to move. He was angry, but very much alive, thanks to the man who was willing to serve beyond what he had to do by making a road where there had been none before. 
and doing it quickly and lovingly. But that's not the end of the story. For the following day, the officer was driving by the same area and slowed as he saw the earth mover. He wanted to thank the driver, the man who had made the road, recognized the officer and ran to him, stammering, the, the, the baby, the baby. He stopped too deeply moved to speak. Surprised at his emotion, the officer tried to reassure him, the baby's all right, the baby's all right. Thanks to you, you helped save his life. Man, that was teamwork we did. The man gulped. I know, but what I did not know then was that was my son. How do you explain that? The beauty is we don't have to explain it. The beauty is it's not us up to us to try to even the score. It's just up to us to take our sandals off, to recognize that right where we are, we stand on holy ground. It's up to us to keep our eyes open and our ears open and our heart open and our hands willing to do what it is that we can do right where we are. We can't predict when the opportunities to be of that kind of service will show up in our lives. But what we can do is continue to practice to be willing to step into those opportunities when they do arise. And that means, as I said, that we keep our eyes open, we keep our ears open, that we recognize that there is far greater good in our world and in each other, <clears throat> excuse me, than we typically hear. To not let ourselves get frightened or discouraged or shut each other out because of things that we hear on the news that seems so big, they're big because we don't hear the other side. They're big because we forget that in the end we really are one. In the end we are not meant to be a human race in competition with each other. We are meant to act as if we are one human family. No one person is expected to do everything. But every person is expected to do something. And all that's required of us is that we are willing to say yes. And I want to leave you with this thought. Serving others is a way of participating in the grace of God and being blessed in return. Serving others is a way of participating in the grace of God and being blessed in return. Namaste. Many people enjoy Reverend Wendy's talks and meditations and aren't able to attend the Unity Center in person. If you're part of our extended family from around the world and would like to help support the Unity Center, please go to our website or download our free app, which offers even more ways to connect with the Unity Center. Namaste. Namaste.